So social media. So why am I talking about social media today? So just think about what has happened in the last day. Let's look, look at the word energy in social media. In the last hour, there have been over 4,500 tweets related to energy. In the last day, 69,000. In the last month, 1.8 million tweets. This is information that you immediately think, who cares what somebody's talking about when it comes to energy on Twitter? But in reality, that's an opportunity to learn about a potential power outage somewhere in New Jersey. That's an opportunity to learn about what customers in California are installing and excited about putting up solar panels. There's rich and growing sources of energy data that we've never thought of to look at before. Now, of course, there are many sources of, of data that are more traditional as well. You look at smart grid data, so utility infrastructure data, but with the twist of adding in the smart grid component that allows two-way communication and the ready transmission of that data from utilities to customers and, and back and forth. We've seen a 20-fold increase in smart meters since 2000 alone, 2007 alone. And smart meters now are able to yield 2,880 or more times <coughs> data the tr than traditional meters. This is a huge, huge increase in the amount of data that's available for, for analyzing the health of the grid, for looking for opportunities to improve uh, on, on, on grid technologies and incorporate Internet of Things technologies into existing energy systems. So the Energy Data Analytics Lab is focused on making use of these new and growing sources of energy data, trying to find the information and value in previously untapped data sources, transform those using machine learning techniques, statistical modeling, you know, data mining, data visualization, to actual, actualize you know, increased reliability of systems, decreasing system costs, increasing environmental sustainability of different systems. So all of this is you know, the goal of the Energy Data Analytics Lab. So we're looking at big data. That's, that's one particular area that, that is of interest. What is big data? Having large quantities of data, so giant files, huge sources of data, streaming data, data that's moving quickly, data from videos, variety of data forms. So looking at text data, numerical data, video data, imagery data, uh, veracity. You never know how much you can believe certain data. <laughs> I'll go back to the tweet analogy as before. So all of these sorts of data are things that could have valuable information that we're looking to capitalize on. So you know, we're looking to do, have descriptive analytics, what has happened in the past, predictive analytics, what could happen, and prescriptive, what should happen. And what, you know, this is excellent for you know, bridging the gap between technology and policy. Uh, so certainly you know, we're playing in the, the nexus of that area. So, number of projects going on. I'm going to talk about one in particular about distributed solar panel estimation. Uh, Matt's going to talk about uh, energy behavioral nudges versus automation in the context of smart grids. And so, you know, all, all of these other projects are active projects that, you know, if you have interest in, I hope you come and talk to me at some point um, and we can get you connected with the right people. Now, look at this image. We're going to talk about this solar estimation project. What do you see here? A lot of homes. What was that? Google Maps. Google Maps. Google Maps. This is a rich source of data on energy. If you look around here, you can see solar panels on a number of homes around, around this particular community in California. This is an opportunity to use machine learning to detect and improve estimates of solar PV capacity in distributed environments like rooftops. Right now, the US government relies on utility reports and surveys to get this information, but it has no or very little information at the county level or more finer uh, levels of aggregation. So when you look at that type of information, that's information you can start making better utility decisions on where load will, you know, how to balance out uh, new generation that's going to be in, in, in certain regions of the country, opportunities for uh, planners, for policymakers to understand why different uh, solar installations are popping up in some communities and not others. Is it socioeconomic you know, uh, factors that lead to that? Is it uh, social pressures? Is, you know, wh what are the root causes? All of this we can uh, learn from this information. But first, it requires an automated approach. So we've been working on using machine learning and image processing techniques to actually find the solar panels. You can see here the red uh, rectangles and polygons around the solar panel is the truth. The green is what our algorithm has identified as being a solar panel. In a small test 
system, 92% accuracy, four faults, alarms per 100 recalls. Not too bad at all. And so this is a map of data plus students, undergraduates, and graduate students who spent last summer developing, working on a real life research project, developing uh, this data set of 18,000 locations of solar panels around the country. This is the data set that we can use for this information going forward that will be used in research and will be soon to be published. Um, so definitely, you know, a really interesting project with broad reaching implications. Now the leadership, as I mentioned before, faculty co-directors, uh, Richard Newell and Matt Harding, uh, myself the managing director, we are partnering with a number of organizations here, so this brings together the Energy Initiative, the Information Initiative at Duke, and the Social Science Research Institute. So who's involved in this? Over 11 faculty and staff on active projects, five external partnerships with companies and other organizations. We're in discussions with 32 other organizations um, that we might be partnering with in the future. Uh, 26 uh, graduates and undergraduates have been involved, and we have participants from five schools, environment, arts and sciences, engineering, business, public policy. Um, we're looking at providing tools for energy data analytics research. So there are definitely opportunities for getting involved in using some of these virtual machines for doing research on protected data that could be proprietary data, any type of restricted data. Virtual machines for non-protected data for using some real computational power to get the job done on these hard energy data analytics problems. We're developing partnerships. Uh, we have data use agreements, non-disclosure agreements, and sponsored research agreements and templates for these to help us connect with external organizations. And there are a variety of other resources that will be growing at um, our website listed below here. Now, how can you get involved? A uh, number of options, opportunities there for, for students. If, you know, number, all the research projects I mentioned, um, there could be potential for, for involvement with the right skill set and, and match up there. So if there is interest there, again, reach out to me, please. And Bass Connections projects. Uh, Bass Connections, some of you may be familiar with, an opportunity to work uh, for a year on a project of research importance with people from across disciplines and different age levels. Um, Data Plus summer experiences for undergrads and some graduate mentoring opportunities there uh, for doing a deep dive into a data-rich research problem. And workshops, competitions, and other events uh, for further <coughs> diving into uh, energy data. So with that, I thank you for your attention. If you have any questions about the Energy Data Analytics Lab, its projects, or opportunities for involvement, please reach out to me. All right, everyone, good evening. Um, like, thanks, Kyle. Um, I'm, I'm one of the co-directors of the, the Energy Data Analytics Lab. I'm also on the faculty here at Sanford. Um, so what I just wanna, I wanna talk about is just give you a, a sense of the kind of research that, that we do at the lab. Uh, so I'll talk about my own mm -hmm. research. And so one of the themes of my research is the idea of how we can actually empower consumers using big data and using technology uh, to actually take advantage of the opportunities that are actually available through the development of the smart grid. And Kyle already mentioned um, the importance of big data here and he had the 3 V definition which is the way computer scientists tend to think about big data. It's about volume, velocity, variety. I think there's actually more to that. I think in, in addition to all of these things, what, what is amazing about big data is the, the ability to actually layer things and make connections that previously were just not available to us. So it's not just the sheer volume of information that matters, it's also the fact that we can connect all these very large amounts of information and gather new insights. And I'm trained, I'm trained as an economist and data scientist, so I'm particularly interested in what big data and this new technology that's available actually tells us about human behavior and the kind of social processes that, that emerge and that are related to, to energy consumption. Um, so this falls into this area of behavioral energy efficiency. Energy efficiency is a great thing, uh, but there's, there's sort of this puzzle that's been around with us for a long time. Why aren't we doing more of it, right? At the fundamental level, it makes a lot of sense from a financial perspective. It makes a lot of sense from an environmental perspective. Why aren't we doing more of it? And I think it boils down to the fact that somehow the behavioral processes, the behavioral incentives just aren't aligned to enable us to actually take advantage of these opportunities, even though financially it actually makes sense. So uh, here's a little uh, a study that uh, came out from McKinsey where they're looking at up to 20% of savings 
uh, are available in the residential sector purely through behavioral means alone. So this doesn't mean that you're going to go out, change your windows, replace your water heater. These are just things that you can actually relatively easily do by behavioral means alone. Right? So why aren't we taking advantage of these? And why are these things, are, aren't these things happening? And the answer is, you know, actually there, there are quite a lot of things that are happening out there in the world that are trying to nudge people uh, to actually take advantage of, of these opportunities. So everyone here has probably heard of the phenomenal success of this company called Opower, right? So Opower is a company that became, that became successful by sending people letters. And those letters were comparing your energy consumption to that of your neighbor. So it was a very, very simple act of providing information. Something that maybe you wanted to know, but you, you, up to now you hadn't, it wasn't available to you. So now you have this additional piece of information available. So I am interested in not just information, but also the extent to which information coupled with technology allows us to make behavioral changes easier. So if you think about it, we live in a world where everything is demanding our attention. Right? Constantly, on a sort of 24-7 basis, we, are, we have to pay attention to our Facebook, to Twitter, to all these other important things in our life. Right? So when are we going to have attention, when are we going to have the time to pay attention to the thermostat settings? Right? We can save a lot of money if we actually paid attention to the thermostat settings, but when are we going to do that? Um, so if we're not going to do it, who is going to pay attention to like, all of these things? And I think the answer there lies in, in automation. We don't have to actually pay attention to all of these things and constantly change things ourselves. We are at a point in our sort of technological development where technology alone, smart algorithms, smart technology can actually do this for us, right? The question is, are we actually going to let technology do this for us? And what may be some of the behavioral implications? And how much of it are we going to allow there to happen, right? Um, so the question then becomes, how do we figure this out? This is not a cheap thing to implement, right? Uh, it's costly to put technology out there in the field, to give technology to households. Uh, is it going to achieve the right kind of savings, right? Um, and on top of that, we have to think about the economics behind it. And so one of, the, one of the important things that technology enables us is to go back to some really, really basics of microeconomics. And if you've ever taken any microeconomics class, you'll, you'll have heard something like, you know, price ought to equal marginal cost, right? But in one of the things that's true about the world, uh, this is sort of a, a chart uh, that looks at the, uh, the cost of electricity in the wholesale market. This is not the kind of price that you're paying on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, when you're paying your electricity bill. The price of electricity for your home is going to be fixed. It's known well in advance. There's no variability there. And the, there are many reasons why we've had this system, but one of them was we just didn't have the technology that would allow us to actually change the price of electricity in real time. Every second, the price of electricity varies. In your home, up to now, until the development of the smart grid, we just did not have that technology available to us. So we've always had this mismatch between sort of prices, and it leads to inefficiency. Uh, fundamentally, it's also going to lead to sort of blackouts and other sort of things that we actually do not want. Uh, now, smart meters are making all of this possible, and they're allowing us to interact with the economics of the energy environment in a way that just wasn't possible before. Um, so how do we? when I mean interact, what forms could that take, right? And then you realize that actually there's a continuum of ways in which you can interact with the outside world and with the energy world. Uh, you could have it, you could interact in a very passive way just by having that information available to you on a website. Whenever you feel like it, you go to the website and you're going to check what the price of electricity is, uh, what your demand is, and then you're going to sort of establish how to react and how to change your behavior accordingly, right? But that puts a lot of the pressure on you. You have to make an active decision, take time out of your day to go somewhere and actually pay attention to what's happening in energy markets. Uh, a different way uh, that's a little bit more, you know, closer to home, you can have a display. You can have something like a tablet on, in, your, in your kitchen, on your fridge, and that thing is going to tell you, here's how much electricity you're using at this moment, and here's how much it's costing you, right? Um, so that's one, uh, that's of a, a sort of an intermediate level. Or then you can think about smarter thermostats, for example. There's no reason why, you know, you should have a, maybe a tablet on your fridge that tells you electricity is really expensive, but then require you to then go to your thermostat and adjust the settings, uh, maybe change the set points to take advantage of the fact that maybe you want to save some money right now, 
right? In fact, these devices can be programmed uh, to respond directly to energy prices, so you don't have to do anything like it. And in fact, many other appliances in our homes that are, that are going to come on the market very soon have the ability to communicate over the internet, to communicate with, with, the, uh, uh, with the smart grid, so your washing machine, your, uh, your dishwasher, all of these things could automatically decide when's the right time for them to actually run as opposed to just letting you do this and potentially make mistakes about it. That are costly, fundamentally. So the question then from a research perspective is how do you evaluate this? How do you figure out, are people going to respond to these kinds of technologies? So a lot of the research that I'm involved in, I tend to work with utilities, and we actually go out into the field and we set up experiments. Uh, we, large-scale experiments, we get lots and lots of households, we divide them into different treatment groups, we leave some aside as a control group, and then the different treated groups, they're going to get one or other of these technologies, they're going to get one or other pricing schemes, and then we see what happens, right? Uh, and because of the availability of data, we can actually measure their behavior at an incredibly fine level. So minute by minute, I can still figure out what it is that you're doing over the course of the day and how you're responding differently to these different technologies that are going to be available to you. So let me just give you an example of, of what happened in, in one such experiment. Um, uh, basically, this, we, we changed households. Um, in the, uh, so the, the price was constant during the day, but in the afternoon, the price would go up. Right? It would go up quite substantially. And the question then became, are people going to respond to that price change? Uh, and are they going to respond differently when we make different technologies available to them? So what this particular utility did, uh, it gave households um, either a website um, or a website and a tablet, uh, a website and a program of a thermostat that would automatically adjust to these price changes, or all three of them, right? So they potentially have every available technology uh, to them. So these different colored lines, um, Basically what they mean is the, the ones that are sort of flat, the blue and the green, those correspond to sort of website and website plus tablet. So if I leave it up to the consumer to actually pay attention to these things, not much is going to happen. So this graph basically plots the savings over the course of the day. This is sort of 24 hours, so each little interval corresponds to a 15 minute interval um, and very much it's going to be flat. So they, they, some consumers are going to try and change their behavior in the afternoon when prices are high, but by and large, you're not going to see very much. People just don't change their behavior. On the other hand, if you give them a technology that automates this behavior for you, right? So you don't have to be at home and change the settings yourself, you're going to see some very, very substantial savings in the afternoon. So this is up to 60% a reduction in energy consumption. That's a lot, right? It's, it's pretty hard to achieve that. And all of this is just achieved by um, changing the settings on the thermostat. Right? So um, where, where do I stand um, in, this, um, in this set of ideas? I think automation is very important. Um, I think it's going to be increasingly hard for us to, to take advantage of the opportunities that big data provides for us and these changes in the economic and technological environment. And I think fundamentally we are actually willing to accept uh, a lot of technology making decisions for us. And I think one of the questions for me in my research is where does the threshold lie? How far are we prepared to go before we say, you know, that's enough, this is, this is more than I'm willing to give up in terms of control over my life. I think we're actually willing to go quite far in terms of letting smart algorithms and smart devices uh, make better decisions for us. Um, and, but this is one of the insights that I think we, we, we're getting from um, from the energy space. And as we're sort of transitioning to a smarter home, um, I think these types of insights are going to be important. So I'm going to stop here. You can contact me on a number of different platforms, including Twitter. So um, thank you. <laughs>